Good afternoon, good evening, oh, well, good morning. I always say that because you never know when you're watching this video. This is Dr. Garayas, Bio 112. We're about to do chapter seven, but um, just to go over a, a question uh, that came up in class about the glycolysis uh, laboratory. So when you're looking at this, it looks quite complex, but they gave you a little key that's here on the bottom. Now, you know that uh, in the mitochondria, and this is like a, um, an example of the mitochondria, there are three processes, glycolysis, citric acid cycle, and ox oxidative phosphorylation. And uh, some people have some trouble with this. So let's see how this works out. Well, this is inside the cell, and of course, this is the mitochondria, and uh, this is, of course, so what's this have to be? This has to be the glucose model, right? How do I know? One, two, three, four, five, six carbons. Now, if you look up online, like what glycolysis is, let's say, for example, this thing. Uh, wait a minute, it's not being nice to me. To minimize this, bring this out here. So if you look at this, and can I zoom in? <coughs> And zoom, zoom, zoom. So if we look what glycolysis is, you can see here that it's going to eat up two ATPs to make ADP. And it's going to have this thing called NAD to make NADH and hydrogen. And the goal of glycolysis is to break down glucose into this uh, uh, pyruvate or pyruvic acid. And just like uh, lipase or amylase, the suffix ASE means an enzyme. But uh, the suffix ATE, I mean, or uh, uh, like, like ATE, like lactate, lactate is lactic acid. Pyruvate is pyruvic acid. So ATE is some sort of acid. So pyruvic acid is the goal of glycolysis. Now, what does that have to do with me and this class? Well, uh, if I can get this show on the road. Uh, was it this word? Yeah. So what, of course, that uh, uh, that you have to start off with? You start you have to start off with uh, glucose. So that's what this is. So this is glucose. And what are we going to end up with? Pyruvate. So I take this pyruvate and I put it in there. Then we saw Sorry to keep on switching back and forth here, but. Then we saw that what? Two ATP got it consumed and it turned into, it goes ADP. And four ADP went in and then it's gonna yield uh, four ATP. So overall, right? I spent two ATPs, right? So I'm gonna get what? Two in the end. And then I put NAD in, and then I get NADH plus an H plus out. So if I look at go back here. So can I put uh, NAD here? And then NADH here, right? Or uh, NAD, uh, uh, I put my NADH here. And of course, I put in, um, I, I put in uh, ATP. But then I had to do what? I had to eat up some ATPs. So now I have ADP plus P. So you can kind of like derive what this stuff is. And then you could do the same thing for citric acid cycle. So if you look up a citric acid cycle, this is acetyl-CoA. How do I know? It goes, well, if I look up uh, you know, online a picture of citric acid cycle, that's what it starts with. Pyru pyruvate turns into acetyl-CoA. And where's my acetyl-CoA here? I can put that in there and so on and so forth. You could fit, you know, uh, all of these things. This one here, you don't have to look up. What does this look like? Water. What does this look like? If this is water with a big red O and two uh, little Mickey Mouse H's, that's water. So that's what this thing is kicking out. And what are we putting in? Oxygen. So you can put oxygen here, water here, and then you can find um, 
you know, uh, a citric acid cycle and then kind of like derive uh, what are its products and then you can do the rest of it for this as well. So you see how you can get the answers to it. Now, for our purposes, the only thing we need to know is what? Glycolysis, for our purposes and for our slide, is it anaerobic or aerobic? It's anaerobic. Glycolysis does what? Breaks down the sugar glucose. And what do we need to know about the citric acid cycle? Anaerobic or aerobic? Aerobic, right? And does it make a lot of ATPs? Nope. But the electron transport chain is also known as oxidative phosphorylation. Does it not require oxygen right here? Yup. And what's it going to kick out? Water. And what is the most important thing that oxidative phosphorylation, phosphorylation kicks out? It kicks out what? ATP, lots of it. So um, for our purposes, glycolysis breaks down glucose, anaerobic. Citric acid doesn't make a lot of ATP, but I need it in my process because remember, one enzyme goes to the next, goes to the next, goes to the next until we get to, to the end of our conveyor belt. And uh, that's, um, that's our electron transfer chain, oxidative phosphorylation. And you can see it all happens cellularly. Oxygen goes in water goes out and uh, that's how you answer this part right here all right and any other questions uh, uh, I'll entertain them after lecture because I want to get this done because uh, chapter um, your quiz on chapter six and seven is tomorrow so I want to do um, uh, this lecture so I hope uh, that kind of answer your, uh, answers your question but if not come see me after class and then uh, we'll we'll try to figure stuff out so let's now go to, uh, where am I, lecture, and it's chapter seven, it's in unit two, I see, uh, where's my unit, two lectures, chapter seven, Come on, come on, come on. Stuff to do. <laughs> so, chapter seven, skeletal system. We already know from the tissues lecture that we had uh, uh, last lecture that bones are not solid things like this desk or this chair. They're living, breathing things that actually repair itself, remodel itself. And that's why it makes it stronger than steel and more efficient than this desk or this chair. So it's actually an organ system. So there's bones, tissues, cartilage, and its function is, of course, you know, when you fall, protection, movement. Those of us who have broken bone, you break a bone, how well do you move? Not very. We already know about yellow and red marrow. Yellow marrow holds what? Fat. Red marrow holds? red blood cells or blood cells. So another function of your skeletal system inside the red marrow is called hematopoiesis. Hemat means blood, poiesis means production of, and I'll, I'll write, uh, write it down, I'll show you it later, but that's blood cell formation. So let's say, for example, my patient has a blood, uh, has a bone disorder. Don't you think they're gonna have a blood disorder too? Yep, and if that has a blood disorder, don't you think they're gonna have a bone problem too? Remember that story? Uh, did I tell you about the story of a little girl? Uh, she was kicking around. It was like September, October. She was kicking around a soccer ball and then broke three of her toes. Now, does that sound normal to you? No, because you kick a soccer ball and she even had cleats on, you know, the little shoes with little spikies on the end of it. So that's a pathologic fracture because why? She had leukemia. Leukemia is a blood problem. The leukemia then spread where? Where's the most likely next place? Right to bone. Right, and it made her bones brittle, and then she had what they call a pathologic fracture. So think blood and bone, they're cousins, and they're together. And we already know what makes bone stronger than cartilage, it's calcium, and among other things, or the inorganic salt, inorganic salts. So it's also mineral storage. And ladies, those of uh, those of, I was about to say us, I'm not us. <laughs> ladies, those of you who had babies, right, and uh, gave them milk, the calcium had to come from somewhere. It came from where? 
bones. Your skeletal system has a two divisions. We already know that from lab, axial, and appendicular. Your skull, thoracic cage, and your vertebral column are part of your axial, and everything else is appendicular. Of course, bones are different in size and shape, and bones have different shapes, and we're going to talk about the bone shapes in a minute. And remember, and it goes back to what we always talked about, even when we were talking about cells, form equals function. So if, if something has a particular form, there's a reason for it. So let's look at classifications by shape. So long bones. I like pictures better, so let's look at this one. So this is, of course, your femur, which is the longest, heaviest bone in your body. And you see it, it's, of course, long, like a big stick. If we look at uh, this B, I don't even know what this is. All right? What is it? Is it? Yeah. Yeah, but, the, but I'm looking right at it. It looks weird to me. Oh, well. Of course, B matches with this little blue thing. But I don't think it's your calcaneus. I think it's your uh, metacarpal, right? Uh, you have wrist bones and you have ankle bones. So, of course, they, um, that's not a good example. Ooh, let's hear, look, look at this. You guys take a look at your uh, carpals right here. Do you see how they look like dice? Or they look cuboidal? Well, those are your carpals or your wrist bones. And if... I don't know if you were going to pick other bones. I'd pick like this one, this one for being um, a cuboidal shape or a, a cube shaped bone. And those are your wrists and your ankles. And uh, because they're what? They're square, they're cube like. If you look at uh, let's see your skull. Now your skull is a flat bone, so you're going to think of it like a pancake. So what if I put a pancake and I mold it, right? And if you really look at the skull, it's what? It's kind of like a sandwich. There's an outer layer and an inner layer, and they're both flat. So your flat bone, an example is your cranium or your skull. Another example of your flat bone is here, your sternum. That's also flat, it's like kind of like a tie. Now, irregular is easy. That's crazy looking which is this, and I know this is a thoracic because a thoracic vertebrae because it has this wing that's going on here and these things called facets. See these things are here that will connect right into ribs and that's a weird shape. So that's called irregular. What are some other irregular bones? You look at the sacrum right here, that's weird looking. So that's an irregular bone. You look at your ilium, which is part of your pelvic bone, that's irregular. So anything that doesn't conform into long, short, or cuboidal, or flat, is irregular. And our kneecap right here has its own category. It's called sesamoid. Oid is the suffix that means uh, resembling. And sesame, of course, it looks like what? A seed. So I could ask. Your femur, that's an example of a long, short, flat, you'll tell me, long. Uh, your ankles or your wrists, which are your carpals and your uh, tarsals, that's what? Um, uh, cuboidal or uh, short. Flat, think your sternum and your um, uh, cranium, or your skull. Irregular, your pelvic bones and your vertebrae. And of course, your kneecap sesamoid. Wonderful picture. Like it. Like it lots. Next, parts of a long bone. And again, sit and do this, or you can have a lovely picture, which is better. So let's look at it from top to bottom. If you look at your bone, long bone, it has a big long shaft. The complete shaft is called your diaphysis. Dia is a prefix that means complete or thorough. So the main part, the shaft part, is your diaphysis. We already know epi means on top of. So your epiphysis has to be what? The things that are on the top. Or the things that are on the bottom. 
And remember the definition of proximal versus distal. Proximal means it's closer to midline. Distal means it's further away. So if we're looking at this and we're pretending that it's connected to the hip, you can see this part that's like at my hip, right? So that's got to be proximal. It's close. And then I kick my leg out, right? Do my Jackie Chan thing, right? Where's my knee now? It's outside. It's out, right? So that's got to be distal. So if I break my femur here close to my hip, that's called a proximal fracture. If I break my femur, which is this is an example of, in the middle of the shaft, it could be called a diaphyseal fracture or mid shaft. And then, of course, if I break my femur closer to my knee, that's called a distal fracture because it's down here. Now, what else is also cool about the epiphysis, whether it be proximal or distal? Do you guys see this little thing of cartilage here? When you're a kid, you got tons of articular cartilage. The function of articular cartilage is to, it's not only like a shock absorber, it's also there to uh, reduce wear and tear, right? Because you don't want bone rubbing on bone. But what happens is you get a little older, or maybe you played uh, professional football for a while, and then what happens? This wears away, bone against bone, you have friction, then you have bone, uh, bone dust and uh, bone fragments. And that's not good for anybody. You can also see the outside of bone. Remember uh, uh, what we always talked about? Everything on the outside of things in our body is what? Tough, strong, compact bone. But then we have here, everything on the inside is spongy. So we look at the bone, it's an actual living thing. And in this uh, um, uh, spongy bone, we have the two marrows that we talked about. Red marrow and yellow marrow. Yellow marrow has fat or adipose, and red marrow, I want you to think, blood cells or hematopoiesis. So you can also see here, if you got bone cancer, do you see how easily it can travel in and out all these arteries and veins? And of course, right, arteries and veins. If it's red, oxygenated, blue, deoxygenated. If we have a covering on the outside, call your periosteum, you also have got to have a covering on the inside called your endosteum or yeah, endosteum. So endo means inside, peri means outside. And remember, it was done in layers and that's why this thing's crazy strong. You will also see here an epiphyseal plate. Now what's an epiphyseal plate? That's the area of where you grow when you grow up. And when you peak in like the seventh grade, which I did for height, right? The epiphyseal plate turns into your epiphyseal line. Have any of you ever watched um, like uh, those murder mystery shows or NCIS or that kind of thing where they can find bones? Because of the epiphyseal, epiphyseal plate, we can now age the bone. Um, the, the, the exact or relative exact age of the victim all we have to do is do what? Find the long bone, open it up, see if it's an epiphyseal plate, means it's what? It's adolescent or younger, and also we also look at specific sizes. But if it's an epiphyseal line, then it's what? An adult. It's someone who's already uh, finished their, uh, their growth process, and unfortunately, that's their height. All right. So... Does that look like a beautiful picture? And it's easier to me. It's easier than you know uh, this thing trying to memorize all of this. Better like having a picture and knowing what's done. Now you have osteocytes, lacunae, canaliculi. Just know that there's lacunae or like uh, little rooms or little chambers, and canaliculi. We already saw in the bone marrow, there's passageways for arteries, veins, and nerves to go uh, running around. Now, before we go even further, I want to talk about th two other cells that are really important regarding the, uh, uh, the cytology of bone. Let's see if I can I draw. I can't draw. All right, so I can do this. Thank you. 
Okay. So there's three types of bones. Let me make this much bigger for all you myopic people in the room. Osteocyte. Well, I, I got my own. Osteocyte. Uh, let's make it this way. Let's do it this way. Osteoblast. Uh, osteocyte. Osteoclast. So there are three types of uh, bone cells. Now, osteoblast, it was a blast being a kid, right? Immature. I don't really work. So that's an osteoblast. They're immature. They don't work yet. They're young. And of course, the osteoblast will then mature and become an osteocyte. Osteocyte is the mature bone cell. So it has all the functions. Now, we already know that there's mineral deposits, and we also know there's also something called remodeling. So every once in a while, I got to break down bone to make bone. I also have sometimes I have to break down bone to feed babies, right? So the osteocyte then has to give in to the osteoclast. So the osteoclast crash, think what? Break down. And then from the osteoclast, once I break down, it's going to go back up and make some more new osteoblast. So this cycle that you I have drawn here, it's called remodeling. It's the reason why your bone is stronger than steel. Because if I break this table, it stays broken. But if there's some damage, not a lot, what will happen? My osteoclast will break down the damaged parts. It will signal to make more immature cells that will grow into mature cells. Now, when you're younger, this cycle is very efficient. Remember I discussed in tissues how um, uh, a toddler, a three-year-old, a two-year-old can go back their end of the finger because they have very good remodeling. Also, this also happens when I need more calcium. And we already know about calcium. I need it because calcium is one of those ions that turns things on. And also, those of you who are mommies in the room know that you need calcium for milk for babies. And then you could also see how um, osteoporosis, which favors osteoclasts, older age, which favors osteoclasts, and also, guess what also favors osteoclast? Sedentary lifestyle. So if you are a couch potato, if you do not like to move, right, your body will sense what? You don't use it, you lose it. So it will favor osteoclast. That's why the astronauts, the cosmonauts that were floating up there, right, at the, spa uh, the Muir space station, right, they don't really need their muscles, they don't really need their bones. So what happened? It started atrophying and wasting away. Question. Well, uh, which one? Osteoblast? Osteoclast. That is breakdown. Osteoblast is immature cell growing. Yep. Oh, the two things that favor osteoclast is, of course, sedentary lifestyle. Couch potato. You don't move. If you don't move, your body's going to think you don't need it, and it's going to break, break things down. Another thing that also favors osteoclast, just of course, you know, when you get older, um, it just happens that way. You guys heard my Odyssey story. It's funny. You guys find it interesting, but it goes, it's now a signal that what? I have more osteoclast than osteoblast and osteocytes. So now when I walk downstairs for the last couple of years, uh, I walk like step by step like I'm a toddler. Because any of y'all ever fall downstairs? It's debilitating, isn't it? And it's scary. When you were a kid, fall downstairs all day, every day. Crack your head on the sidewalk. And that was called Tuesday. But now when you get older, be careful. And of course, one of the main things that you guys do as future nurses is do what? Prevent fall. They even have algorithms now to warn you guys this person is a fall. Because if an older person falls, it will favor what? Osteoclast, breakdown. Because after you fall, you get hurt, you don't move. So this is a nice question. I could ask, which one's immature? Osteoblast. Which one's the mature, fully grown cell? Osteocyte. And which one is the breakdown cell? 
that breaks down bone, osteoclast. What is the process of all of this coming together? It's called remodeling, right? I'm breaking down bone to do what? Building it back up, but unfortunately, as you get older, it is not as efficient as, uh, as you once were. So that's why I had to uh, stop because this is a, a lovely anatomy and physiology question that's very common. Uh, what am I, slideshow from currently. So we have compact bone. We also have spongy bone. We all know that spongy bone has all these little branches or trabeculae. And if you could see it here, see it? That's why it looks like a sponge. And that's why we have all the marrow in the nooks and crannies. And when this thing was, uh, you know, uh, was alive and living, all, there'll be arteries and veins running all through here. But then when you look at, oh, this is an example of your skull, and you can see how it's actually a flat bone. But you can see here, it's what? You have the compact bone in the outside and then a uh, spongy in the middle. We already know about the osteon, which is the functional unit of bone. It's the bunch of little sticks that make up the, uh, the compact bone. And you know it's compact bone because look how tight it is. Look at all the lamellae or uh, its um, uh, uh, layers. Okay? And we already know the analogy from our tissues lecture. If I wrap a whole bunch of twigs together, the twigs alone, I can easily break. But if I wrap all the twigs together, like I wrapped all these osteons together, how hard is this bone now? It's very hard. And remember in lab, I told you, my last two patients that broke their femur, it required something big, like a bus or a UPS truck. That's what it takes to break this thing. Um, and you can see all the osteon, what it has in the middle, it has artery, vein, and nerves. Arteries, of course, red, vein, blue, and the nerves are yellow. And that's why when I break a bone, won't blood come out? Yep. And what else is also in the marrow? Fat. And when I break a bone, can you feel it? Right? Someone once told me, he goes, oh, I broke a bone, I didn't feel it. That means what? You either have a neurologic, right, or you're lying to me. Odds are you're lying to me because I break this, you're going to feel it. And that's actually how you know you really broke a bone versus like uh, anyone dislocate something? It hurts, right? Right? Did it hurt? But it didn't hurt like constantly like a bone. But then you move it around. What did you, you dislocate? Like a finger, an arm, a leg, your shoulder? Ooh. So you saw the deformity. You were like, ah! did you try to pop it back in? Oh, that's good. Because I've had patients pop it back in and did horrific things to their glenoid falsa, which is the, uh, uh, the, the, the socket which your, um, your humerus goes into. It'll scrape and scratch, and sometimes they even fracture uh, their scapula. I just, I had a patient, you know, I popped it in front, then I did side, and then my brother tugged on it. And I'm like, and you did this in the five minutes that you waited for EMS when you should have just waited for EMS. Now you know how frustrated I am with patients because it's called contributory negligence, right? But at the end of the day, who they gonna blame? Me, blame me all day, every day, because odds are I probably caused it. Major function of bone, of course, provides shape to the body. So if you have a bone deformity, you will see it in what? The body shape. Of course, support body structures, protect body structures. That means body movement, of course, contain tissue, he, uh, hematopoiesis. I, where is that word? There it is, hematopoiesis. I always spell it wrong. It's I before E, especially after this O. I don't know the rule. Blood cell formation. Hemat means blood. Poiesis means production of. It is in red bone marrow. The cool thing is it's not only red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Yellow marrow, of course, stores fat or adipose. And that's why when you uh, soak uh, beef bones, in lovely oxtail soup or sopa de res, it is delicious. Sorry if you didn't eat. Sucks to be you. Next, inorganic salt storage. Hydroxyapatite, also known as calcium phosphate. Just know calcium, okay? And know that there's other salts, magnesium, sodium, potassium, carbonate, but the number one is calcium. All of these salts, right? They contribute to making the compact bone hard. 
making the ASEAN stiff. And after a while, of course, and, and again, uh, let's not focus on osteoporosis, but that's what? When there's more osteoclasts than osteoblasts and osteocytes, what's going to happen? You're going to start leaking out these salts. And of course, if you leak out the salt, what happens? Your bone isn't as strong. You could have a, a pathologic fracture um, and also all these other things. Now, calcium, we already talked about vitamin D. How do you get vitamin D? You go outside, right? We go outside, get a little bit of sun, just a little bit. And then along with your parathyroid hormone and calcitonin, these are hormones that help regulate. And we're going to talk more about that when we're in our hormone chapter. But parathyroid, think calcium. And calcitonin is easy because it looks like what? Calcium. And tonin, we already know what? Tonicity. And calcium is an ion. So can you see how that makes sense? Uh, intramembranous bones and the chondral, nice to know, yada, yada, yada. Intramembranous ossification, endochondral ossification. No, this is not a child development class. I don't like that either. This looks like an alien. I don't like that either. I don't like that either. I don't like that either. Oh, epiphyseal plate. You see here, All right? That's a plate. And you see it's kind of clear. When you get older, that plate turns into a line. And that's how you know. Um, osteoclast, osteoblast. We already, we already talked about that. Blast, I want you to think what? It was a blast to be young. Osteoclast, class, clash, crash, breakdown. Now, let's slow down because I skipped all the ugly slides and this is a pretty slide. And we like looking at pretty slides because we are sexist. All right, vitamin D, calcium absorption. And we already know that's related to what? Parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. And of course, where do we get it? Sunlight. Vitamin A. That's osteoblast and osteoclast activity. Okay, so it uh, it um, uh, it's it's for remodeling. Vitamin A is also for retinol. Is we already know what? Remember, Bugs Bunny, carrots, right, and vision. But for us, for this chapter, think osteoblast, osteoclast activity. It's good. Vitamin C, C for what? Collagen. And we already know what, what's the function of collagen in our epidermis. It makes it what? Or in our dermis, I'm sorry. Epidermis is what makes our epidermis hard and waterproof? Keratin. But the dermis and the lower levels and our bone, we're going to think what? Collagen. And it's vitamin C. OK. Uh, growth hormone obviously stimulates uh, uh, growth, stimulates cartilage, cell division, and whatnot. And the key thing about growth hormone, um, remember when uh, like whoever took care of you told you like you got to get a lot of sleep so you can grow because uh, you ever hear that wives tale like the only time you grow is when you, you, you're asleep? It's true because the only time growth hormone gets released is during REM 3 or uh, REM stage sleep, which is rapid eye movement, uh, which is deep sleep. So more sleep more growth hormone for the child, and uh, it will be better for their uh, bone development. Number of bones, who cares? Now, we're going to, uh, uh, do I want to talk about this? I'm going to be talking about this tomorrow. But now, nah, we're going to skip this. But think about these little ridges that are inside or that are on your skull, and we're going to be talking about that tomorrow when we talk about um, um, joints, okay? Axial versus appendicular, don't need to know the number, but axial, you're gonna think what? The skull, oh, uh, I forgot to show you a hyoid bone. I think they're gonna show you it in a minute. Of course, vertebral column, thoracic cage, and you have these little tiny bones. Now, we already know the largest bone in our body is what? Femur. But the smallest bones, if ever you're on Jeopardy, in your body are called ossicles. There's three of them. The malleus, incus, and stapes. Malleus, because it's like a hammer. Incus, because it's like an anvil. And stapes, because it's like stirrups. 
and it kind of looks like it. you got to use your imagination because the thing that you're hearing right now is, of course, you're picking up during sensory. Right? But this beautiful, silky voice that should be on the radio, because it's not really my voice. It is your interpretation of what my voice is, because when you're hearing me, those little ossicles shake, and then they shake a whole bunch of other things in your head. I'm jumping, right, you know. And then it's going to turn into electricity that your brain can think. So if you think my voice sounds awful, it's not my voice. I'm telling you. I should be, it is your brain. It is not my voice. And if you're looking at me and going, oh, what's this short, stout, little man? No, that's <laughs> Very good looking. I should have been a model. It's just that everyone else's brain isn't on my level. So that's my problem. So axial versus appendicular, think what? These things, axis, um, uh, a, a top. Um, appendicular, it's everything else. And the pectoral girdle, your pecs or your chest, right? Also known as your shoulder girdle, that has your scapula and your clavicle. Your scapula is, of course, your shoulder blades. Your clavicle is your collarbone. And of course, the upper limbs, we already know radius versus ulna. What's thumb side? Radius. Right? Radius, right? And pelvic girdle, those are your hip bones, uh, ilium, ischium, and your uh, pubic ramus and your lower limbs, of course, your femur, tib, fib, patella, and of course your foot and the bones in our foot. Now we learned we learned something extra today because we talked about short and cuboidal bones. Your carpals are your wrists and your tarsals are your ankles. So if you have carpal tunnel syndrome, you have a problem with what? The ligaments that are on your wrist. And if you have a tarsal problem, you have a problem with your ankles. And what are fingers and toes? Phalanges. Fingers, phalanges upper extremity, toes, phalanges lower extremity. Use the visible body. No, thank you. Now here we have the visions of uh, the skeleton and just what I went through a minute ago, colored in lovely red. Doesn't this remind you of the MCU universe? Anyone know what I'm talking about? No, you guys don't. Uh, you, you are what my uh, our professor used to call a Philistine. Nothing in the arts. That's okay if you're not a nerd like me. Red Skull? No. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, some of you don't want to say it because you don't want to. Right? So that's axial, of course, right? So you have your sacrum, you have your vertebral column, your uh, ribs. 12 of them, your sternum, of course, the happy face here, and that's all what? Axial. Everything else, which is colored normal bone color, is your appendicular skeletal system. Here's your hyoid bone. It's kind of floating. It's connected to a whole bunch of cartilage. All this cartilage here is your larynx, and it's connected to your um, windpipe here, and your windpipe is a whole bunch of C-shaped cartilage, and that's called your trachea. So you got your trachea here, larynx, and your hyoid bone is kind of protecting this. And this little guy that's sticking up here, that's your epiglottis. That's the thing that closes your trachea when you're drinking or eating. So should you be singing or talking while you're drinking? No. Should you be singing or talking while you're eating? No, because your epiglottis should close that down. So when you're eating or drinking, you're kind of like holding your breath a little bit. This is a nice picture, but remember the one, the ones I like for lab, you saw it is very simple. Just frontal, parietal, right? Uh, what looks good here? Uh, nasal, of course, the one on the top, maxilla, the one that makes you the strong chin, man, makes you man, mandible, and of course your, um, Cheekbone is zygomatic. These things are called your orbits. And then you have um, other bones, your ethmoid, sphenoid, nice to know. But the ones that I just went over, those are the must knows. Those are the ones that are right there. And also, for future reference, every time you see the word foramen, that just means whole. And uh, your future neuroanatomy and stuff, every time you have a foramen, odds are a nerve 
an artery or a vein has to go through one of these little holes. And you don't want to see this. Oh, this is a nice one for your temporal. See how it's actually real on side? Here's your uh, sphenoid here, zygomatic again, frontal, your pair of parietal bones right here. And of course, in the back, it's called your occipital. You have your external acoustic meatus. It's not meatus, this is Latin. It's pronounced meatus. And that, of course, goes inside to your uh, inner ear. Uh, all the other stuff, nice to know. Remember, we just want basic, basic. Another thing you'll also notice here is kind of cool. Your head is not solid, right? It has holes in it, and these holes are called sinuses. And you guys know how sensitive your head is. Have those of you who have long hair, and then you cut your hair, what does your head feel like? It feels like, oh, oh, what happened? Like, I lost like eight pounds. Or some of you already have sinusitis now, right? What does your head feel? It feels like a bowling ball. And then your sinusitis get over, you're like, oh, oh, I can move my head again, right? Because why? All of these little holes, well, they're not little, but all of these holes here. And actually, the way we uh, kind of diagnose that, I could take a pen light. If I put a, a pen light and try it at home, get a pen light or a flashlight, and go in the dark, and then just put it on your face, here on your cheek and on your forehead and stuff, it should glow a little bit, like a, like a reddish uh, yellow glow. Right? So trust me, it should go a little bit, right? When you put it on put it on you. Because there's holes in your head. The butt goes, it'll be a much duller color if there's pus, blood, or whatnot in there. And also, another reason, and we're gonna talk more about it when we're talking about hearing. Again, why is it? Am I super egotistical to think my voice is the most awesome voice in the world? Okay, a little bit, right? But all of us believe our voice is awesome. Why? Because you're hearing your voice, not only through your ears, you're hearing it through the best speaker in the world, which is your skull. You also have bone conduction of hearing. And that's why if anyone, anyone's ever had their hearing checked out, they had like the tuning fork, and then they put it on like on top of your head, and then they put it right here on like on the part of your jaw. No, no one got checked out, so you could be walking around like me, deaf, and just, just going, hey, eh? what? But you now see that your voice resonates through this lovely speaker. And if ever you have like high end speakers, the baffles inside look like what? The insides of your skull. They look like this, all these wonderful little shapes. And that's the reason why when you're singing in the shower, you think what? Not only is it because your brain is processing it, but you're listening to your silky smooth voice through your the best speaker in the world. But then the rest of your family thinking you're trying to drown a cat in the toilet, right? Which is, I've been told what my voice sounds like. Next, when you look at this, of course, the back is occipital. And again, future reference, all these foramen have arteries, veins, and nerves running through this. And you got to think of this also. It's all, there weren't too many holes in my head on the top, on the sides, and on the front, weren't they? But there's a whole bunch of connections and holes here on the bottom because what's easier to get at? This part of my face, this, or something that's on the base of my skull? All the delicate stuff is on the base of your skull. And if you look at this, this is your foramen magnum. Your, um, your vertebral uh, column and your spinal cord go through this thing. So you can see how well protected this is. You also have here your hard palate. We're going to talk about the importance of this thing right here when we're talking about gastrointestinal. Now let's talk about soft kids. Infantile skull, an infant. And we all know infants have soft spots. We all know. We're all, everybody in this room is guilty of poking a kid, right, on the top of the head, right? You know when they're babies? Why are you looking at me crazy? Yeah, you did it, right? But do we always do what we're not told? Ever since I was a kid, I always found it very interesting how little baby skulls are what? They're soft. And then you can press on the what? The little uh, uh, the thing that goes up and down, right? Those are fontanelles. Those are soft spots. Because is a, is a newborn child, is an infant fully cooked? No, right? They're still what? In the process. And it can take anywhere from two months to two years. You'll learn it when you go to your child development class 
right? Um, and also, those are just why does my baby's head have to be soft? Thank you, right? Because um, you guys see what a baby looks like after it's born, right? That's not a round head that comes out. That it is amazingly deformed. And then you're like, oh, uh, especially if it's your kid. Well, I hope it, you know, uh, you know, uh, evens out in the next couple of hours. We'll see. But that's the why the fontanelles and they have soft spots. Now, uh, clinically, soft spots are really neat because you can also diagnose dehydration. Because how easy it is to get a line in a kid, in an infant, or uh, assess dehydration. It's actually kind of really easy. One, check the fontanelles. If they start dropping or they depress, that's one. Two, when you look at babies, or even infants, or even toddlers, their eyes should be what? Glossy. You should be able to see a reflection, right? And then three, you guys know your babies more than anybody else. Any significant changes in, um, uh, in uh, uh, personality. So if you have a sleepy baby that's cranky, crying, and upset, that's something to think about. Or if you have a very rambunctious baby, very active baby, and is sleeping the majority of the day. And I'm telling you, it goes, it goes, if we get more of that out to mo layperson mommies, there'd be less pediatric problems. I can't even tell you how many times mommy comes in and goes, oh, baby hasn't been feeding in a while. And I go, when, this morning? And they go, no, Tuesday. And I go, mommy, it's Thursday, mommy. And then I see what? The eyes dry as a bone. Baby is either lethargic, all right, has no reflexes, and the fontanelle is what? It's a golf course. It's, it's dipped like this, and it's scary. I gotta put a double line, and how many of you here know uh, how to do phlebotomy? How easy it is to put a line in an infant? It's not, right? Even with the new, uh, you guys generation, love it. You guys have this infrared reader now. It's really neat. I saw it on Inova. And I'm like, oh, that's cheating. But you know, it's a technology. But me teaching phlebotomy all these years, what's the best? Fingers, digital, this is the best feeling, right? Oh, uh, look at the skull, look at this baby skull. So deformed, so ugly, right? And it's got all these little spaces. Look at it, it doesn't even look like a human yet. Because it isn't, right? Now, these anterior and posterior uh, fontanelles, remember, there's timing to it, and you'll learn that in your child development course. Uh, and um, actually, for any child development thing, all it is is memorizing when. You know, like, when could, should the child talk? When should the child walk? When did, should the child ask for the keys to the car? That kind of thing. Now, your vertebral column. I could show you all these pictures, but what's better? I mean, I... rewind. I could show you all these words, but it's better to have a picture. So just like in lab, when I showed you this, when you look at from the posterior to anterior, or what they call posterior anterior view, which is from the back to the front, is there any curvature? Nope. Straight as an arrow. But if I look at the lateral, there are natural curvatures. So we look at the cervical, right? Um, the first one is called your uh, atlas. Now, if you guys remember atlas from, uh, uh, I forgot what it's like, you know, like grade school when they talk about those stories, you know, the guy who held the world or something like that. I can't remember. Remember, I got left back in second grade. So everything from second grade to like, I don't know, sophomore year of high school is all a blur to me. But all I know is an atlas does what? It holds up. It looks like this, like a Y. I'm sorry for those of you at home. Wait, let me put my camera on so you can see me. Can you see me? This creepy owl thing is looking at me. Can you see me? I'm here, so I'm talking. So I hope it's working. So it's like this. An atlas is like this, right? So if it's like this and it's holding up your, your head, what will that give you the ability to do? It'll give you the ability to nod your head. Yes. Now, we already know what axis means, which is your cervical two, your second cervical vertebrae. So that means what? I can now move my head no. So if my patient has a C2 fracture, can they shake their head no? Nope. If they have a C1 fracture, 
Can they move their head like this? No. Nope. Right? So C1, think what? Atlas. C2, axis. Um, you also have everyone feel in the back of your neck. See that little buff right there? And for those of you CNAs, that's one of the places you check, right? You check, of course, the back of their head, and you also check the C7 or cervical 7 or your seventh cervical vertebrae prominent for you know bed sores. Because that's the thing that what? It's going to put pressure and put pressure on the bed. And if your patient doesn't move, what will happen eventually to that skin? It'll erode, and then you're going to have a wound, and then it's going to be a problem. Let's look at the thoracic vertebrae. There are 12 of them. There are seven cervical, 12 thoracic. If you look here, sorry, I need to zoom in because I am blind. You see these little things? They're called facets. And it's called a costal facet, which is to your vertebrae, not vertebrae, to your ribs. So the thing about your, uh, uh, your thorax or your thoracic vertebrae is they have to have these little facets to connect to your ribs. The lumbar, what's so special about them? Look at the body of each of, this is called the body or corpus of your uh, vertebrae. You see how thick it is? It's much thicker than all the other cervical and thoracic, and that's your lumbar. And of course, in between each and every one of all of your vertebrae is your IV disc, also known as your intervertebral disc. That's the thing that if it slips out, also known as the nucleus propulsus herniation. And remember, herniation just means what? Something that's sticking out that shouldn't be sticking out. And last, you have one big fused bone, that's your sacrum. And oh, look at here, look at all the holes that all these nerves can come out of. And also, see all these, this is called a pedicle. All, out of all these holes, a whole bunch of spinal nerves come out. So you can see what would happen if an IV disc slipped here and then starts impinging on this. You can either get what, sensory problem, or you can get pain in the form of what, motor problem. And last but not least, what's your tailbone called? Toxics, okay? So the recap, seven cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, one big fused sacral, and of course, lastly, your single coccyx. And those are the parts of your vertebral column. What does it mean when it's primary and secondary? Where is it? Uh, I think it means the way it's curved, but uh, I don't know. I don't know what that is, to be honest with you. I glossed right over it. Let me look it up. But the thing I know about curvatures is, is that you look at it, um, wait, not sideways, but what's it called? Lateral. If you look at the lateral view, they're supposed to be natural curves. But if you look at it from a posterior, anterior, or AP view with anterior posterior view, it should be what? Straight. And I think they're talking about like the way it's curved, like curved this way, curved that way. Primary, I guess, is curved out. And secondary is curved back. I don't know. Yeah. And then kyphosis and lordosis is uh great, I can't remember which one's which. Kyphosis is is it humpback or sway back? Humpback. So that's what up here. So that's when the curvature is exaggerated up here, and sway back is down here, and that's lordosis, and the curvature is exaggerated back here by the lumbar. Can you have both? Yeah, and it, you, uh, you can have actually all three. If it's really bad, you can have all three, especially with uh, especially with degenerative joint disease. Expect two out of three, actually. Ah, uh, here's your uh, sacrum, coccyx. Nice to know. Ah. Let us get to Z ribs. Um, I like this picture. This is the best. So let's look at the ribs. They're numbered. You have true versus false. And why do they call them true ribs? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If you notice, they all connect uh, with their cartilage directly into the bo body or the manubrium sternum, which is your sternum. 
this part, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, true ribs. Now, what are false ribs? Everything else, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Now, what's special about the false ribs is 11 and 12 don't connect into anything. So 11 and 12 are called floating ribs. And the function of floating ribs is to cover your kidneys uh, posteriorly. And again, whoever built this bill is pretty darn perfect because this thing has to move. And if we had like more ribs attached to the front, it would be more difficult uh, physiologically to uh, move this uh, thoracic cage up and outward if everything was just attached to the sternum like this. So to recap, thoracic cage, one through seven, true ribs. Eight through 12, false ribs. With 11 and 12 being special, those are called floating ribs. And of course, this is your manubrium sterni or your manubrium, which is part of your sternum, your body, and uh, this little bit of uh, cartilage here on the end uh, called your xiphoid process. And the xiphoid process is, uh, those of you who had CPR, that's the one where that little notch thing that you have here, that you measure up where you're gonna put your palm placement when you do compressions. Look at this wonderful, zoom in on this guy, because he's healthy. And you can see here, right? Because they're not attached to the sternum, right? All the four ribs are attached to what? Um, um, eight ribs, or in the case of the 11 and 12, not attached to anything at all. So if you look at this, look where the heart sits, a little bit to the left. And of course, you have a lovely. And if you see this, where do, what do you do? You see the vertebrae very well. This this view. No. If I want to look at my vertebrae, don't you think I have to take a picture from the back? So this is how I know this is a picture from the front. And you can see the heart. You can see the ribs. You can see your um, uh, your clavicle really well. And this view is called a AP view or antero posterior. So it's when, how looking at me. It's when, let's say, let's say this is the x-ray machine, right? It's pointing at me. So if it's pointing at me, it's gonna have a beam of x-rays. It's gonna hit my front first, and then my back, and then the plate. So that's called an AP view. Antero posterior, then the plate view. Now, if I wanted to look at my vertebrae, what do I do? Right? I stand like this, right? The, the, the x-rays are going to go where? Posterior, anterior, and then the plate. And of course, where should you be? Behind the shield. And even if you're behind the shield, wear the apron. It's a big lead apron. Or if you're smart like me, leave the room, go outside, Wait until the red light is uh, uh, turns uh, turns another color other than red, and then go back in. Uh, because remember, every time you get exposed to radiation, it's what potential for mutagen, right? So something to think about, especially for your future radio techs. Sternum, breastbone, of course, the manubrium. I think of it like a tie. So the winter knot is the manubrium sternum, sterni. And then you have the body, and then the xiphoid process at the bottom. We already know this guy, right? What's this? Clavicle, this. Scapula, this. Funny bone, this. Well, you can't tell because it's, uh, I don't see the thumb. <laughs> Upper limb, we know this, we know that, we know that. Oh, what's this? How am I in time? All right. How's this? 10 minute break? Uh, because I am kind of almost done. So let's have 10 minutes. So like a, kind of like a pilot cleanser. And then uh, because I'm looking at you guys, you guys are making me tired. And I'm also tired. Uh, so or how is this? Oh, wait, wait, it's nine. What is it? Nine? 9.15? 10 minutes sound good? Because I need a drink and also, uh, and also those of you playing at home, 
the owl talking to you. Ten minutes, please. All right, I'll see you guys in ten. Did everyone sign in the sign in sheet? Please do so. So I know you are here. Oh, I need a drink. Hello, hello, lone beer at home. I'm hello. here. Hello. So, do you, do you see me? You see yeah, me? I can see you. See my camera? Yeah. Okay, let's turn that off because you don't really need to see anyone. <laughs> all right, but you can see this, this thing. Yeah, I can see all, all right, that. Here we go. So, how, how's it so far? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Is, my throat is just optimal, a little but bit. Hey, is yeah. what it is. I love saying that. All right. Yeah, I'll I'm see you in like in uh, nine minutes. Okay. All right. Bye. All right. Bye. But there's so many cones. Sometimes I think, do I have to go to the right of these cones with the police on? Oh, I know. I or do I have to go to the left of the cones for all the construction workers where I could kill them like ants? Which way do I go? I see it, so then I drive like super slow. So if you're behind me, supposed to be you. Yeah. Okay. I go the other way. And then the the ramp that go the ramp that like goes to the mall. I'm usually going like 90 miles per hour, and then I'm like, oh my exit. Yeah. You can easily uh -huh. see it, and then I forget that it goes almost 90 degrees. So you so you went down from 90 degrees 90 miles per hour to 60. Hitting the 90 degree angle, 60 miles per hour is not advised. So then I went, and all I hear, and it's funny watching the uh, watching the Odyssey drift. It's kind of cool, actually. Now I always I always say that to my kids, and now it's like a saying in the guys' family. Like, if you ever have somebody that is like they have a drop car and it's like and it's really loud, but they're not going very fast, right? We always say that guy is too fast, too furious. So we say that guy or that guy is living. Quarter mile. Oh, we have one, but what? My nephew's one. My nephew's one of those. He's like, he comes in, and he goes nowhere. No, but like, but like, when I get my tricked up car, I, I, people can look at me and be like, ah, you're I, I'm a different. I just, I want like one of those big long Cadillacs, the ones like Elvis had. And I want to put corn bonnets and I saw in Texas one, those were cool. And then, right, I go, I want like, uh, I want like a horn, like a fucking horn. So it's like, nah, 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 or like, you know, something like that. Something that's people need. The, yeah, from Ant-Man, right, that kind of thing. Hmm? No, I want the, because long time ago, my dad had a horn that you can program. And that was one of the first programs that, because we tried to make it program into the Filthy National Anthem, like, but then it turned out it sounded like the ice cream guy. So every time my dad hit the horn, the kids would be like, so, which by the way, ice cream people really should learn how to slow down. I, I, go, uh, I was on my scooter, I have a new electric scooter, that thing goes like 30 miles per hour. I could not catch up to ice cream. What if I was a cop? So, I was like, I was like, maybe because I'm too heavy. I was on max, and that thing's like, mm, and I'm going, and I can hear him. I'm like, son of a bee, how am I gonna get this guy? Because my kids, they, they all gave me like, like change, so I got it all like in my in my scrub, and then I'm, mm. I love these little little electric scooters. I love the way these people just leave them like everywhere. Mm, let's get out of here. Miss Thompson, can you see the class when I put when I take the camera on, or do you just see me? Hello. Hello. Oh, 
Oh, of course. Oh, when I go to World of Beer, no one's there. No one shares me, but. No, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, um, my crew does the one in Arlington. Well, but... yeah. It's uh. <laughs> you know that big CVS that looks like it's like when we get strip mall, but it's like on the bottom part of a bottom part of a building. I don't know. The GPS just takes me there, and then I then I see the CVS on the left. That's a lot of them. You could be taking me. I did already. Put them up. Six is on, seven's on. I made a whole bunch. Because I was in Fuego this afternoon. I remember a time Mercer and Versa wasn't so common. Now it's every day. It's every day. We used, we used to get excited about that 20 years ago. Now it's. Yeah. Yeah. Last time I was in a hospital, like I took a, I took a look at the board. And I'm like, I'm like, what the hell is the whole was the whole place infected? But there, uh, the nurse was telling me, yeah, it's normal. I'm like, so wait, it doesn't so sound normal. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow is a quiz. It's a quiz. Uh, six and seven. Because you have seven and eight. No, look at the. Uh, no, look at it. It's an email. seven Yeah, but you always refer back to what? The thing, right? So if you look at the, the schedule, right? Quiz on six and seven. And then oh, we're doing seven and eight. Well, we're doing seven today, eight tomorrow. Right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I probably made a boo boo. It would be what? Uh, which are all? It would be all of the above would be a function, or however I. Or what's not a function would be what? None. That's like a double negative kind of question. And you guys, I know I wouldn't put a question like that. That's a. That's an awful question. That's an awful question. Where was I? Where was I? Where was I? All right, is 10 minutes up yet? Because I'm kind of antsy. Minute. Minutes when let's see uh, view animation slideshow from the current slide. Hello, hello, mic check. Is this thing on? So, Miss Thompson, when I turn on my mic, you can see me, or do you see the whole class? No, I can see you. Now, if I move over here, can you still see me? Yeah. I can see the whole oh, it like does. follows you. Oh, it follows your voice. Yeah, and IT said that's not creepy at all. No, that's creepy. I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that. That's like Rise of the Machines. That's how that's how Terminator starts. You guys know that. <laughs> I watch movies. I know what's up. Uh let me turn this function off, shall we? Uh, let's see if I can. Next thing you know, my toasters be like. You all mind? No, no. All, all y'all have Siri and stuff. That 
it's really cool, but it's creepy. Question. Yeah, because when I'm eating, not eating, that's uh, when I'm hydrolyzing or I'm breaking down a phosphate bond, right? So ATP turns into what? ADP. ATP is adenosine triphosphate. So there's three phosphate bonds. But if I need that energy, I'm going to use up one phosphate. So it'll be then ADP plus P or PI with that little I. Um, that's what that is. All right, let's get this show on the road. Um, da -da 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 and I'm still in record mode. Pointer options. No, 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 no. I want. Oh, it's Boston. What? What do you mean, Massachusetts? No, Boston. Boston. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right on potato, potato. But I'm one of those people. I don't know streets. I barely know where I live. The, the GPS takes me where I go. And if it doesn't, let's say the machines take over, then I'll be one of the first victims. Just how it is. Now, if you look at the carpals, you look at here, uh, don't they look like dice? So they have to be short bones, slash caboidal bones. Your metacarpals, of course, meta means change. You're changing from your wrist to your fingers. So carpals, metacarpals, phalanges. By the way, your ankles do the same thing. Tarsals, metatarsals, and then your phalanges, lower extremity. Uh, da, 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 carpals, don't need to know this, uh, but hey, this is good. Now, how do we know which is which? Well, of course, we label our phalanges one, two, three, four, five which the thumb, also known as your pollux, P-O-L-L-O-X, is labeled one, and the pinky is five. Remember you have prox proximal and distal? Phalanges is the plural. Phalanx is the singular. And maybe you've heard the word phalanx. Uh, maybe you've read history. You know how troops are, are in rows? They're in rows called what? Phalanx, which are rows of fingers. And I have a proximal, middle, and distal. Now, which was the one the little kids can go back? Distal. So if I had a fracture here, that's a proximal fracture. Middle, and then of course, distal fracture. And this is upper extremity, one, two, three, four, five. Pelvic girdle, let's look at our pelvis. Of course, you have your ilium, that's this big thing right here. You have your pubis, which is this part right here, and goes this donut down here. I like calling the ischium. So ischium, pubis, and your ilium, along with your sacrum back here, that makes up your entire pelvic girdle. This um, uh, thing right here, that is cartilage, and that's your pubic symphysis. Now, there's a difference between of course, male and female pelvic girdle. The female pelvic girdle will be, of course, wider and will be more bowl shaped to accommodate baby. And the male, and also the, the sacrum will be also equally curved because remember, I want the baby to be cradled. And then when it's time uh, for parturition, parturition, right? Then the baby can uh, have a better time uh, being born. Uh, ilium, ischium, pubis. Now, the acetabulum, <laughs> obturator for Raymond. Let's look at this. Um, acetabulum, that's the, the thing that's going to connect into your femur. Okay? So, and you're going to know these things because um, uh, these, um, this thing is, there's common fractions all over the place, but the pubis, ischium, I mean, uh, the pubis, ischium, and your acetabulum here, common, common places where things will go awry. Obturator for Raymond, remember the donut? It's a hole, right? And we saw in our laboratory, what was that beautiful big nerve that starts with S that goes your sciatic nerve, 
that goes through that <coughs> hole. Ilium ischium puber autism, and he's a uh, here's a uh, a nicer version of it, right? We of course female versus male, everything is what lesser, right? And it's heavier in weight for male because we're just fatter. How's that? <laughs> no, it's because male, of course. Yeah, we're also fat, but male, of course, um, uh, has a, a more muscle mass, more bone density. Because why? You're you're bigger, you're heavier, and have uh, more muscle mass. So if you have more muscle mass in general, you're going to have to have bones that match it. So um, that's in general. And if you look here for a female, everything's rounder, and um, your sacrum is also what curved. And uh, you'll see much more in your obstetrics. And every once in a while, especially if baby's really huge, this uh, pubic symphysis uh, sometimes detaches. Yeah, it's kind of fun. Lower limb, let's look at Z leg. I don't know what Z leg is in German, but if you add a Z to it, you know, stupid movies, right? You add a Z to anything or an L to anything, it's like Spanish or so stupid some movies, but they're funny. Femur is your what? Long bone, short bone, what? Long bone. And it's the heaviest, longest, right? Now, what's the smallest bones in your body? Ossicles, and they're where? In your ear or middle ear. Um, of course, the patella. And here we see the patella with all out its, with all, uh, without all its accoutrement, right? All the extra stuff. Right, all the tendons and whatnot, and you could see it's shaped like a seed. Hence, the term or the shape of the patella is sesamoid. You have your tib fib, your front larger, more anterior bone is your tibia, and your posterior thinner bone is your fibula. Tarsals, of course, is your heel. Uh, um, uh, not heel, sorry. Scratch, we want that. Tarsals is your ankle. Your metatarsals is the dorsum of your foot, and of course the phalanges are your toes, but your heel is called your what? That we learned in lab. Calca naeus, right? So it's the, uh, let's look at the calcaneus. This thing right here, your calcaneus, hard, hard bone. And this bone's really interesting. I've had several patients had hairline fractures, and they were okay. They just had a little limp, and they were walking around with it. But then you, you saw the limp and you go, hey, what's up? And they're like, oh, I don't know. And then you look, yeah, nice. And hairline fracture means what? It's a closed fracture. The, um, uh, the bone is, they're right there. They're right there together. But for whatever reason, it's still sticking together. But you keep on messing with it. Is, it gonna, is the fracture going to get bigger? Of course it is. Again, the foot, just like the hand, lower extremity. One, two, three, four, five. One being the big toe and then five being uh, small toe. And then you have a proximal, middle, and distal phalanx. Yay, last slide. Decrease in height. Good news to me, right? Age 30. Calciums, of course, will fall. Levels will fall. So your bones won't get brittle, but are they strong, as strong as they were when you were 20? You? Nope. Uh, osteoclast outnumber osteoblasts when you get older. Spongy bone weakens before compact bone, and that makes sense because spongy bone is is on the inside; it's softer. Now, things start increasing after menopause, unfortunately, ladies. But we already know that, so of course, your gynecologist has a game plan for that. Hip fractures is common. Let me tell you, hip fractures are in co are more common with people with more sedentary lifestyle, right? Uh, people who go out more and, and actually, uh, since I'm doing a lot of research on uh, uh, hip and joint replacements and all that stuff, I go, it, uh, the data still pushes towards people who are more active, have less, uh, less fractures, less problems. But again, too active, what will you have? Fractures. Vertebral compression uh, fractures are common. Um, uh, and 
Well, in my opinion, no, but hey, the book said so. So with that being said, that's chapter seven. I believe. Let's look at um, the. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Let's look at um, the announcements. See if I got some notes up. So if I look at uh, the announcements, uh, I have six uh, uh, questions and videos, and then seven and eight chapter eight summaries with sample questions. Um, and this was like uh, the first term, so I there's a lot of extra stuff you don't need, but uh, because if you look at it, let's take a look at it real quick because it's from uh, a term ago. Where is it? A lot of stuff, but when you look at it, it's essentially the slides, but skip right down to the good meaty parts. All right, then I got what questions based on the above. Okay. And it's us, it's six and seven, All right? And then don't do eight because we're doing eight when tomorrow. Are we good? So it's 936. Anyone have any questions, comments, recipes? If not, uh, open until uh, 10 p.m. or whenever you guys want to finish, right? Uh, and uh, open Q&A. Those of you at home, thanks for playing. I'm going to be signing off. Any questions from you? Nope, you're good. All right, uh, email me if you got any questions on some of the lab stuff, because I know you okay. will once you start looking at it. Okay? All right. Sounds All good. All right. Thank yeah, you. Well, see you when I see you. All right, bye.